Okay, I'm going to invite uh, the second panel, and we have a very interesting case presented by uh, Dr. Robert Stevenson. Enders, you're, you're on the second panel. Oh, sure. Okay. I'm conscious that there is uh, a bit of overrun of time here. Um, I'm Dr. Robert Stevenson. I'm a private obstetrician and gynecologist, and uh, I work, I've worked in Hong Kong for about 25 years now. And uh, over the past about five years, I've got to know Dr. Kumta quite well. Uh, and I was uh, very flattered, but a little bit uh, puzzled by his request for me to come and talk here today. Um, but I know he's got quite a quirky sense of humor, and I think he selected me on the basis that uh, I might be uh, a little bit of a loose cannon. And uh, so uh, I'm not going to disappoint him. And before I start on my um, presentation, I'd just uh, like to reflect a little bit on what's gone on so far and, the, and what's the point of us all being here on a Saturday morning when we could out, be outside doing uh, other things that we might, more, <laughs> might enjoy just uh, a little bit more. Well, it's an absolute proven fact that uh, everybody here is going to go away from today and within a very, very short space of time, they're going to forget almost everything that was said uh, this morning. If they remember 5% in a couple of months, and then we, we've, done, we've done very, very well. Uh, and I think what's coming over to me from listening to what's going on uh, is that um, what we're dealing with uh, is uh, questions where there are, there are no clear answers. We've selected, you're uh, largely medical students. You've selected yourselves on being very, very good at answering questions that have uh, right and wrong answers. Uh, and that's not really fair because uh, as we, we find out, life and medicine isn't really like that. It constantly presents us with questions uh, that have two wrong answers. Uh, and you know, we can deal with these sorts of questions in, in two ways. We, could, we can do the uh, flip a coin uh, method, <clears throat> choose an answer, and, and just move on. Uh, or we can, we can struggle. We can struggle with the two wrong answers, and inevitably, we will come up with the wrong answer. We just want the least wrong answer. And the first message I'd like you to take home today is that that struggle is really important. That's what makes you grow. That's what makes you make better decisions in the, uh, in the future. And, uh, and that's uh, what I hope you take home from, today, from this morning. Uh, the other one is um, uh, highlighted by Sheiky and uh, uh, by Mike in his presentation that we're all going to be part of a system. Um, and that system has lots of arrows and lots of nexi, nexi whatever the, the plural is. Um, and it's very, very uh, easy to fall into the uh, <clears throat> uh, situation that you, you don't matter. Um, but we talk a lot about patient autonomy. It's very, very important to remember as you go through your careers that uh, doctor autonomy is equally important to make these systems work. When you are starting off and you're a small potato, then it, it may be very difficult to see how you can influence the system, but you can. You can in a very small way, and as you grow to become big potatoes, you can influence, influence them in an even more important and, and profound way. So those are the two messages that I've sort of taken home today. I still struggle constantly with difficult uh, uh, questions, um, and um, <clears throat> I hope that uh, uh, this sort of thing gets uh, uh, repeated and repeated um, and that uh, we, we learn to, to do better for our patients in the, uh, uh, in the future. Uh, I'm very grateful to Dr. Rump who talked about insurance because uh, he intentionally ignored exactly what I'm going to talk about which is the uh, question of medical uh, indemnity. and. <clears throat> Being a private practitioner, uh, I'm very much conscious that I'm exposed to the uh, real financial realities of running a practice in central Hong Kong. The landlords seem to think that every end of lease is an opportunity to increase the uh, rental on my uh, <clears throat> office by as much as possible. Uh, my nurses all need paying, and I need to 
balance this always, uh, every day, every single consultation, you know, the financial reality of having to uh, make everything work so that I can carry on uh, providing care for patients, but always keeping at the forefront of my mind um, what we've talked about uh, constantly is that the, 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 the interests of the patient are, are most important and at the forefront of every sort of decision. <clears throat> now, in talking about the medico-legal um, aspects of uh, doctor-patient relationship, um, all, <clears throat> most of these points have been uh, touched on. The, the public has a very romantic idea of uh, how doctors should behave in emergency situations. And uh, uh, one of the early times that I travelled with my uh, wife, uh, this was highlighted. We were on a, a plane from South Africa to... Uh, Hong Kong, um, and I got the call, or well, the call came out, you know, is there a doctor on board? And uh, I sat down in my seat, I'd already had one or two beers, and uh, I wasn't really feeling like uh, uh, I was going to um, embark on a consultation and a medical opinion, but the call was an insistent, and it came out again, and my wife pressed the button for me, <clears throat> but the light went on above my head. And the, uh, the uh, air hostess came to my seat and said, are you a doctor? I said, yes, I'm a doctor. <clears throat> and she said, um, uh, will you come? And I said, well, just tell me a little bit about the problem first. And she said, well, apparently there's, a, there's a woman on board and she's got a very young child and apparently she's given it some medication to calm it down and the child is absolutely uncontrollable and the mother's in hysterics and the whole thing is just falling apart. And I listened to this and I said, well, I'm not really qualified to deal with this situation. She looked very disappointed. <clears throat> I said, but, you know, what you need is uh, you need a qualified nurse um, with experience in midwifery who's done some childcare and uh, is a mother herself. And the <clears throat> air hostess looked at me and said, well, where am I going to find somebody like that? And I turned to my wife and I said, there's, <laughs> there's one sitting right here. So she had to go and calm down the whole situation. She was far, far, far more effective than, than I was. Anyway, everybody who mentioned this uh, situation of the doctor-patient relationship, particularly in emergency situations. So this is a situation where the patient hasn't chosen the doctor, which is the usual way of doing things. This is a situation where somebody um, has uh, got a suddenly acute problem, and it's really the doctor who has to make the decision to... Uh, initiate the doctor-patient relationship. <clears throat> and a lot of people who I've spoken about, they said, well, it's all in the Hippocratic Oath, isn't it? I said, well, no, actually, it isn't in the Hippocratic Oath. There's nothing to do with uh, this sort of situation covered in the Hippocratic Oath. But there are ethical uh, um, uh, prescriptions for us. The General Medical Council in the UK has published a good medical practice guide, and it states very clearly, in emergency, whenever it arises, doctors must offer assistance. And in the International Code of Medical Ethics, it says that, repeats this and echoes this sentiment, that a physician shall give emergency care as a humanitarian duty. So there's definitely an ethical aspect to it. So, you know, what stops us uh, in this situation of offering uh, um, emergency care? And Dr. Professor Kumta um, pointed out in the first thing, there may be some personal risk. You know, you may not be a good swimmer and somebody's drowning, or a building may be uh, uh, on fire. Or, like me on the aeroplane, I'd had two beers. Um, you know, maybe I wasn't in a, uh, a very good situation to offer a, a, a medical opinion. Um, or there may be some fear some uh, of your job might be at risk. I don't know how many people here follow the, um, the Premier League in, in UK, but... There was an instance at the uh, beginning of the season, the first match of the season. Um, there was, <laughs> yeah, the manager of Chelsea, Jose Mourinho, um, sacked his team doctor for running onto the pitch at what he deemed to be a tactically inopportune moment, which could have lost them the match. Uh, rather ironically, uh, yesterday we heard that Jose Mourinho has actually been sacked for not being a very good manager. And it may be that his... Uh, lack of empathy and his uh, inability to uh, feel what other people are feeling 
Um, although he's undoubtedly one of the best uh, football managers uh, on the planet, may have led to the fact that his team aren't doing very well and aren't performing for him, uh, and has led to, uh, to his demise. Um, or, uh, and this is going to be <clears throat> perhaps the major help, uh, part of my presentation, is uh, the fact that um, a specialist, a doctor, may not have any indemnity cover. So that might apply to um, me if I was uh, working in America or holidaying in America. That might uh, not be keen to go and uh, help an emergency because my insurance doesn't cover me there. Uh, or, and this is a very recent uh, change, um, applying in Hong Kong and to, to other places, where it might apply to a particular specialty that you don't have uh, any cover anymore. Uh, now, the usual state of affairs is that uh, at the beginning of uh, a working year, um, or <clears throat> certainly in private practice, less so in government practice, where the indemnity is usually covered by the, uh, by the employer, but you have to uh, organize some professional uh, medical insurance, um, <clears throat> and we go to a medical insurance provider, and depending upon our specialty and their calculation of our risk, then they tell you a, a, a price, and you, you sell your risk for the year's work. And <clears throat> whenever any problems arise from the work that you do in that year, it'll be covered under that sort of contract. The change that's happened this year uh, is that uh, the uh, actuaries who advise the, um, insur the indemnity providers have uh, come to the conclusion that because of the rising costs in, uh, in obstetrics uh, and because of their increase in frequency and because of the incredibly long time for, what, for which that risk is outstanding, it's 21 years at least, um, that it is now impossible to calculate a reasonable uh, premium to pay for that risk. So the situation that uh, has been uh, operating now and, uh, <clears throat> and will fall for the foreseeable future, I think, is that the risk remains with the doctor, and the doctor then has to go back to the uh, uh, indemnity com company on an annual basis uh, and see whether the company will or won't buy the risk for that year um, and how much it's going to cost. And the really worrying thing, <clears throat> and the thing that's made me decide that it's uh, not in my interest to carry on the obstetrical side of my practice, is that after I retire, I will have to carry on, one, asking if I can be covered, and two, paying the premium, if it is uh, available to me, for 21 years, if I'm going to be uh, uh, covered. So I've decided that I'm not going to carry on my obstetric practice, uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to practice just gynecology. I estimate that about 20% of the obstetricians in private practice in Hong Kong have uh, taken the same decision as me. Um, and this has created a big question. Um, we are still going to be uh, in hospitals uh, uh, <clears throat> where we do our gynecological work, uh, and it is inevitable that emerg uh, obstetrical emergencies are going to uh, occur. Uh, and my question to the indemnity provider is, if this happened, would I be, recover would I be covered as a, a good Samaritan, someone just uh, stepping in to try and uh, help in a situation uh, where there was an acute need? Um, so I wrote to our provider, there's only one provider in Hong Kong, it's the Medical Protection Society, uh, and they <coughs> considered my situation and they replied to me that if... Um, I was happened to be in the hospital working as a uh, gynecologist and an emergency occurred on the, medical, on the obstetrical ward um, that uh, I would not be insured uh, if I went to uh, help in that situation. And you may say, well, okay, but you know, um, how, how likely is it that you are going to be um, uh, the result of a... Um, a difficulty if you, if you do go and help? Well, it, it's not nil, as I will, as I will show. Um, so I'm going to describe some, uh, some cases. <laughs> First one doesn't involve me, but uh, the, the next two do. 
Uh, you've got green and red cards, so as we go through it, then I want you to put up your green and red card at the right situation, uh, <coughs> and we'll, we'll see what, whether we get some sort of consensus or whether there's uh, some areas of difficulty. Okay. As you can tell, I'm a bit of a fan of the Premier League. It's uh, full of uh, amazing personalities and, uh, and quite considerable drama on a weekly basis. Um, and just as the first case I'm going to put uh, forward is a situation where um, Bolton Wanderers were playing away in a cup tie at uh, Tottenham Hotspur. And one of their players, a guy called Fabrice Mwamba, collapsed after 40 minutes. And <clears throat> play was still going on and uh, the team doctor was on the touchline and noticed this uh, frantic gesturing from uh, the player standing next to uh, uh, <clears throat> Fabrice. And the first question is, what should the team doctor do? We've uh, heard that uh, team doctors get sacked for rushing on the pitch at tactically inopportune times, but there's a guy lying motionless on the ground. So, uh, first question. Team doctor should remain on the sidelines until the manager says it's tactically acceptable to enter the field of play or green, team doctors should attend to the player as soon as he realizes they're in an emergency. Cards. Everybody, even the people asleep. Good. So, green, team doctor. Team doctor, as soon as he realized Fabrice wasn't moving, picked up his bag, sprinted onto the pitch, turned him over, <clears throat> and started administering uh, CPR. Easy decision. Now, in the ground that day, there was uh, a doctor called Andrew Diener. Uh, he was a cardiologist, is a cardiologist at the London Chest uh, Hospital. <clears throat> as, soon as, he saw t as soon as he saw that uh, Fabrice was receiving CPR, he turned to his brothers and said, uh, uh, this is a serious situation. Um, I'm a consultant cardiologist. I deal with this thing every day. You know, do you think I should go and help? And they said yes. The first steward they asked uh, said, no, you can't go on the pitch. They've got everybody they want, um, everybody they need. You know, you'll get arrested, uh, go back to your seat. Um, uh, Andrew uh, decided that um, uh, that was perhaps uh, not in the player's best interests um, and so went to try and uh, find another um, uh, attendant. Oh, sorry, I can't hear me. Okay. So um, they went to find another attendant. So do you think that uh, the cardiologist was right to go back to his seat or to try and assist, find another way to get onto the pitch? Cards? Good. No, <clears throat> no reds, and that's exactly what he did. So he managed to find another uh, <clears throat> attendant, and the attendant let him onto the pitch, and... He uh, started uh, <clears throat> helping the people. There was an ambulance uh, at the entrance of the, uh, uh, at the exit of the pitch. Um, they arranged for the uh, ambulance to go to the London Chest Hospital where they had a full lab with automatic uh, CPR machines. <clears throat> and uh, after fully 78 minutes, they managed to get uh, Fabrice's uh, heart going again. And, um, and this was... Uh, uh, the end result. Um, for those who need clarification, Fabrice is the guy in the middle. <clears throat> so he survived and, uh, and he's doing very, very well. So in those situations, you know, the doctors responded in a, <clears throat> in, a, in a very positive way and got a good outcome. Uh, unfortunately, not all outcomes are the same. This is the hospital, one of the hospitals where I work. This is uh, Hong Kong Adventist Hospital. Uh, and I was there uh, a, couple of day, a couple of years ago um, on the labor ward. I'd just seen somebody who I'd uh, delivered a couple of days before um, when a great commotion started in one of the rooms. A nurse is running out, panic everywhere, um, call code blues, and there was even blood on the nurse's uh, um, uniform, and I realized that a major hemorrhage was taking place at the time. So I knew that I had a full clinic of patients waiting in uh, my office in town. Um, and so 
One option would be to leave the labor ward as quickly as possible because I've got uh, the clinic to see and <clears throat> I didn't want to keep them waiting. Um, or to drop everything and go immediately to see the patient and commence resuscitation. Cards? Still all green. Good. And that's what I did. Um, <clears throat> I to teach the advanced life support and obstetrics. I've dealt with this situation many times. But this lady had almost exsanguinated on the ward. And in spite of extensive resuscitation, taking it down to the... Uh, uh, operating theatre, being joined by her own doctor, undertaking an a emergency postpartum hysterectomy. Unfortunately, um, she developed a uh, intractable DIC and she, she died. Um, I was aware that I would have to uh, make a, some sort of uh, um, uh, declaration and I went to the police station and had to write a statement. Um, and then a little while later, um, a coroner's uh, hearing was uh, convened uh, and I received a letter with this rather worrying um, sentence. Um, I was called to the coroner's court um, and also to inform me that my conduct was likely to be called into question. And I asked a few people and this was quite an unusual uh, um, <clears throat> line to be included in this. And all became clear when uh, I received the court documents um, because uh, in it was contained a report by a pathologist of the post-mortem that he'd undertaken um, which uh, um, basically said that uh, the actions that I'd taken on the uh, labor warden in the operating theater uh, that day had contributed to the death of this, uh, of this poor lady, which was very, very distressing. Um, it involved uh, two days of giving uh, evidence uh, in the coroner's court um, against two barristers who were not particularly on my side um, and uh, two rewrites of the pathologist's report until it was deemed to be acceptable by the coroner um, and all in all uh, quite a distressing um, uh, event on, on my part. Um, uh, that was uh, something that I managed to um, get over. And then a few months later, then I received uh, a letter from the patient's uh, family solicitor uh, saying that they were uh, instructed to uh, claim damages uh, to sue me for my uh, um, contribution to uh, the care of the lady in the hospital. And, and to this day, I have no, I've not received any notice that I'm, I'm not going to be uh, subject of a... Uh, of, of a suit. Um, there was appreciation from the hospital nicely um, and they said that uh, uh, they wanted to express their gratitude for my valiant assistance and someone who represented the best aspects of, uh, uh, of uh, characteristics of uh, doctors in that position. So there was uh, some sort of uh, compensation but I felt motivated to write to the president of the Hong Kong College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and just to ask for um, the view of uh, my professional body uh, on this sequence of events. And he was motivated enough to write a leader in our quarterly magazine in which he stated that it was his personal opinion that it was unconscionable for a doctor to deliberately walk away from a person in need of help. Uh, and then uh, an, another thing which really um, put in place um, the hard place and being between a rock and a hard place, uh, that he wasn't sure that a doctor who did walk away could be entirely confident that he would not be sanctioned by his uh, professional body. So. There is me now um, working in hospitals uh, in Hong Kong and a considerable number of my uh, professional colleagues um, who are going to be exposed to the situation uh, where we may be called upon to uh, act in uh, uh, an obstetrical emergency where we know that we have not uh, got cover. Um, this is another hospital I work with, the Matilda on, on the peak. And just to illustrate um, how often this is going to occur. Um, I was there and my, my insurance change ended in September and this was in October. I was in the operating theatre 
uh, assisting uh, a friend of mine doing a uh, um, gynecological operation. Uh, and a message, a telephone call came down from the labor ward to say that there was a lady having a major postpartum hemorrhage uh, and could the anaesthetist, because they didn't know I was in the operating theater, could the anaesthetist uh, go there immediately and help? So just this, I think this is the last one of the green cards. Um, so what was I to, what was I to do? Um, should I remain in the operating theater? Because I've got a power responsibility to the patient having surgery. Or should I go to the labor ward to assist with the postpartum hemorrhage, disregarding the fact that I'm no longer covered for obstetrics? Green. How many greens, how many reds? OK, so there's a mixture now. That's good. OK. So I chose the red. OK. Um, and I chose the red part, I think, prior uh, to uh, the change of the indemnity cover. Um, the patient in the operating theatre was being uh, operated on by a very competent uh, doctor. I was just there to, uh, to assist. I think I probably would have gone straight up to the labor ward to see what the situation was. <clears throat> but what uh, I was conscious of, uh, the Matilda Hospital has a resident uh, obstetrician specialist, um, so that they could be called as a, uh, a matter of urgency. Uh, they're always there 24 hours a day. Um, Plus, we, I didn't have any information as to how big this postpartum hemorrhage was, and the anaesthetist was going that, up there to have a look, so I asked him to refer back to me as quickly as possible, um, whether my help was going to be uh, of critical importance, um, and within five minutes, uh, he'd phoned down to say, no, everything was under control. Um, the specialist was, the resident specialist was there, the doctor's own specialist was uh, on her way, uh, and he had started off uh, the resuscitation, the patient was actually stable. So um, it certainly gave me um, food for thought, because it's going to happen again. Um, if the panel is anywhere around, uh, I put together um, just a couple of questions, which uh, perhaps we can think about now, or maybe have the second presentation. and. Uh, no, I think this would be the last presentation, unfortunately, otherwise... Um, we go too far over time. Yeah, sure. so we should get the panel. Should, should we have the panel yeah. down? I think uh, I'm going to pick on Enders as a punishment for being late. <laughs> <laughs> Enders, do you, do you think we've reached a point where medicine is practiced so defensively that the uh, doctor-patient uh, relationship is being adversely affected? So uh, are you asking me my opinion or my impression about what's going on in Hong Kong now? <laughs> Your opinion. Could, could it be in the context of that particular situation where you don't I mean, now you were expected to go, but you've been sued because you went in. Um, that I put that up there as it uh, highlights the, uh, uh, the difficulty that uh, quite a considerable, I mean, we're talking uh, one in five uh, obstetricians, gynecologists are now obstetricians. So this situation is going to reoccur on a, on a, on a, on a regular basis. So, um, so could we could we sort of specify because Ender is a great surgeon and and oh. and uh, what would what would your and of course Danny is there as well. So what would your situation be? You're obviously you have a postpartum hemorrhage, and you're expected to go because that's what the doctor-patient relationship demands. Otherwise, uh, you know, there's a risk of mortality, and because and and she's understandably even not your patient. And then you have a mortality, and then the person who interviewed gets, uh, and this is what classically happened in the Good Samaritan instances of uh, Good Samaritan acts in the US. So now you're being victimized for doing what is expected of you as part of uh, duty. And, and with, with no protection in place. No. It's, uh, it's really a tough one. Um, 
But going back to your first uh, question, I think um, for the time being, um, we are not that defensive yet. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, in different uh, specialties, uh, the situation is a bit different. For obstetric and gynecology, now because you have then the option to opt out for the, uh, uh, you know, insurance cover coverage for the obstetrician, uh, obstetrician practice. So um, when you encounter such a situation, if you don't have the insurance cover, you may not actually want to take your head into it. Um, but for other specialty, um, for example, in, in, in surgery, we, we also have subspecialty, like liver surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, and so on. If I don't have the insurance cover, actually, if I go in and, and suppose I'm helping the patient, but actually I may be in trouble. So I think um, uh, it is actually, a, some, to some extent, it's affected by um, the insurance coverage. But on the other hand, if at that moment, there's no other, no other doctors around, and if you're the only one to, that you may help the patient, um, I think uh, I would still try to do something um, as a good Samaritan at Brave surgeon. Yeah, a brave guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think this uh, situation also happens in pediatrics. Because for pediatrics, we also include neonatology. Now, there will be also w uh, ways in the premium for the neonatal practice. That is a much higher risk for those uh, uh, taking care of baby in the neonatal intensive care unit. Like in the field of pediatrics, we also have the similar discussion like in the uh, obstetrician set. For those uh, uh, pediatricians who only have right, the... Just, just can you, can I just ask the students to remain quiet? If you're not interested, you, you can, you're most welcome to leave. But do not, do not speak. That's completely impolite and, and unbecoming of Chinese university students. That's, an ex that's the least we can expect. Now, so, so for pediatricians who only have the insurance cover for general pediatric practice, but not for neonatology. So if the similar situation happens in a private hospital, that a newborn is having serious condition that require resuscitation, I think for as a pediatrician, even though if we are not covered, I think we still having this Samaritan Act to save the baby unless there's already other neonatologists around that they can provide adequate care, then certainly we can stay uh, behind. Otherwise, we have the duty to save the, the patient. Thank you. Danny, you, you can't escape. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a tough situation. Uh, on one hand, we have this uh, litigious uh, atmosphere and also this medical in indemnity coverage and on the other hand, we have our professional ethics and moral duty to act. Now, um, in his situation, it would be even more complicated if you have a pilot arrangement with the private hospital that you are providing consulting services that you are obliged to act um, as a capacity of an honorary consultant or whatever consultant uh, agreement you have made with the hospital. Um, concerning uh, whether you have the capacity to deal with that particular emergency situation because nowadays we are talking about super specialization. Um, a general surgeon may not be able to do a liberal surgical procedure. I agree entirely. Um, and common law, as uh, Alexandra mentioned, we don't have a positive duty to save life. We don't have a positive duty to rescue. But if you assume the duty of a rescuer, you have to provide reasonable skill and competence um, to help that patient. That means if the patient suffer from a minor abrasion over the ankle, you don't chop his leg out because this is an emergency situation. I mean, you have to be reasonable and proportional. So coming back to Dr. Lee's uh, argument, um, nowadays we have a super, super, super specialization on neonatology. When a near leg gets into problem, whether a general pediatrician uh, can help or not. Put aside the indemnity question, I think a reasonable doctor even without indemnity, should help in the situation and provide reasonable and proportional care in the circumstances. Well, wh why shouldn't, why, why then the indemnity providers have run away? If, if they've run away, that's basically uh, because they think business is not good. Then 
And then if the professional organizations that control, for example, the, the, the letter, uh, the quote from the, from the college, expects that that is the moral duty, then somebody should provide the indemnity. That's my first, uh, if not, then we, we, we should convince the government either to limit the cap or to say, well, you can't, you can't have a claim because it's otherwise service and practices is uh, untenable. Um, although I work uh, part-time as a med medical protection society consultant, um, I'm not here to um, talk about the uh, organization's policy. Suffice it to say, um, there's no written policy saying against offering indemnity protection to Good Samaritan X so far, as far as I understand. So if you do something out of good faith, with good professional ethics, within your reasonable competence, and proportional to the situation, I think Medical Protection Society has made the statement that we will cover to, to that extent. Um, Dr. Lee, can you define what um, Good Samaritan at, um, I mean, in the MPS perspective? Now, um, I think the lawyer can, can tell you better. Um, common laws always uh, talk about every case turns on its own facts. I can't, to, I can't present to you too general, but um, obviously one of the example I've just said, um, uh, um, you, you don't do something out of proportion and out of reason, reasonableness. Now talking about Dr. Comte's case uh, in, in the first place in, in, when he was on the plane, a right, patient having AROU, he has considered three options and I think all these three options are reasonable options and within his capacity. You won't do a major cystectomy, okay? And even you come to the patient, offer him some comfort or some hot water pad uh, down his butthole, I think that is a reasonable treatment. Um, of course, once you assume your duty as a doctor, people have different expectations and depends on the circumstances, you need to offer reasonable and proportional care to the patient, even during emergency situations. Well, May I? I we, we've asked a specific question and even in, uh, what, what this does for me is it raises up um, areas of uh, debate and argument. So I've asked this specific question of the indemnity provider about a postpartum uh, hemorrhage and would I be covered in that situation? And I have uh, a reply to say, no, you will not be covered in this situation. But then I have my, um, uh, my, my new insurance which says that I am insured to uh, look after pregnant women up to the 24th week and women who are postpartum. So or, uh, immediately there's a contradiction. You could argue that once the lady had had the baby and was having a postpartum hemorrhage, that then I would be covered because you, the MPS has said that I'm covered for postpartum care. But I've asked a specific question describing an instance of a postpartum hemorrhage and been told that that particular instance um, uh, will not be covered. So already what we've introduced is uncertainties and contradictions um, which are very, very difficult for uh, people to process in emergency and very pressurized situations. Uh, and this is the area of concern, which I think, you know, on a societal level, is actually detrimental. Yes? I would like to raise two issues about this very interesting case. Number one is, uh, from my understanding of your presentation, it seems like your response, which was very appropriate and timely, was more of a basic life support type of response to resuscitate the patient and not really a major obstetric intervention, which seems to be very, very reasonable in the circumstances. And the other thing is whether there is a systematic issue in that when, the uh, from uh, what I understood from your talk, the pathologist also signed out the case as, you know, death potentially caused by whatever interventions were done. DIC is a huge umbrella diagnosis caused by massive hemorrhage, caused by many different things. Is it a systematic failure in terms of how we are interpreting the events, which also leads the public or the layperson to misunderstand the, the case and how uh, the events the, transpired? Yeah, I think the, the major issue in this uh, case, or in this situation, was that um, 
a, to, my, to my advanced years, quite a young and inexperienced pathologist who hadn't taken any um, cognizance of the clinical situation, situation had been presented with a, 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 a dead body and made some findings and drawn some uh, very damaging and wrong conclusions and that this is what gave cause to the phrase in the letter from the coroner that my, if I had done these things which the pathologist said that I had done, then I would be very, uh, I would be guilty of you know, gross incompetence and uh, have contributed to the death of the patient. It, 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 his interpretation of the facts was completely wrong, um, but it still meant that I had to go and uh, defend my situation um, in a very uh, tense and difficult situation. I would hope that, that there would be an opportunity for another expert witness pathologist who would be able to... Uh, and hence uh, the two rewrites of the pathologist's yes. report once we got to court in order to take into account things that should have been taken into account before he submitted his report. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Dr. Ram. So I was wondering whether uh, we could learn some lessons from uh, our colleagues in the United States where um, the issue of being litigated or uh, being, being sued for malpractice or whatever it might be or, is, is much, much more common. It's, it has a longer history and it has much more um, it's much more in the public eye, particularly because of the punitive damages where people are just being ruined by one of these litigations. So, so I'm wondering whether we can learn from them. What, I'm, I haven't researched it, but my, my notion is that, yes, in fact, people don't touch things they are not insured for. Doctors don't touch anything they don't have cover for, which is seriously damaging, seriously damaging to the reputation of medicine and to, to the patient-doctor relationship. Thank you. Yeah. So, so just to take your example, right, you have uh, yesterday, I was actually driving past when the minibus accident happened. I tried to get off and, and the police and everybody just, uh, you know, uh, and then the people were, victims were taken to Tuneman Hospital. So because of uh, uh, c severe cranial injury. But just imagine if they're to a local hospital where there's no neurosurgeon, but there's a general surgeon who says, like, you know, I can do an emergency burr hole and save life in this con con context. And I actually, uh, you know, as a resident, uh, I've done several burr holes. That's a life-saving uh, treatment. But now the expectation is that, okay, this is head injury. You need a neurosurgeon. And I think we are probably damaging our own uh, profession by moving in this direction. I totally agree with Dietloff, so I just wonder what your comment is. Um, and the general surgeon has disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, um, it's difficult to comment, right? because you know it's uh, case by case. For, uh, for, for, for the, I mean, based on what you mentioned um, about the accident yesterday, if the patient uh, was sent to the Loftus Hospital much where there's shorter. no neurosurgeon. Okay, but much shorter time. But then uh, he 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 probably has a um, extradural, I mean epidural, uh, extradural hematoma. Um, so it's a matter of how soon the neurosurgeon can come. So if the neurosurgeon can come in within 30 minutes or 15 minutes, so why would a general surgeon rush in and do a so-called burr hole to save life, life-saving burr hole? Um, but Say if you are actually working in a remote place in the United States, the liberal surgeon, even by helicopter, may take two hours to come. Then it's a different, totally different uh, story, because um, um, so you need to think about the the um, the different environment and the availability of the specialist uh, expertise. Uh, I mean, in terms of time, uh, so so so. We cannot, you know, have a very general overall uh, comment. I agree with Anders that we have to see this case uh, case by case because we are trying to help that, but that has to be within our capacity whether we are doing something of good or doing harm to the patient. If we are 
doing something that we, I have never been doing a bird hole, if I ask, ask me to do the bird hole, definitely I'm doing harm. But if somebody need help and you have that capacity to do certain extent, certain extent that may help the, the patient while waiting for the other people to help, I think that is still a reasonable approach. I think there is a general uh, cross-professional responsibility here that uh, uh, by all means we must um, give a, a, a truthful and honest uh, appraisal of uh, the work of our colleagues in emergency situations, but we must resist the temptation if we are super specialist uh, orthopedic surgeon dealing with hips and there's someone else dealing with knees who uh, you get an opportunity to criticize, uh, we must be very, very, very careful about uh, how quickly we are to, to condemn because, yes, we, because we have super specialized, may have been able to do a marginally better job, um, but it does not mean that uh, other people who uh, act, again, in good faith and try and do a good job and, and, and aren't, aren't maybe very experienced uh, uh, in doing that particular procedure but just not chosen to have uh, uh, adopted it as their label of super specialization. Um, we, we, I think, don't help ourselves uh, by taking opportunities to have a go at some of our colleagues sometimes. Okay, I'm going to, we're only 15 minutes over time. I've, I've got a five minute uh, case presentation. Otherwise, Clara, who's, who's, uh, who I called, would be very disappointed. But 